Okay, here we go. Let's see if uh, we will be allowed on the internet today. Will the lords of the internet grant us access? Looks like Facebook just granted us access. Access? Access? Access. <laughs> Uh, let's find out if I'm live on the, uh, the old Twitter sphere. Twitter sphere is live. It is live. Excellent. Uh, and the last but not least is Rockfin. We are live on Rockfin. How are you out there, folks? If you are tuning in, hello, welcome. Welcome to the stream. Thank you for hanging in there. Uh, if you are tuning in, please make sure you share this stuff out. The first couple minutes of this are always slightly awkward. It takes about 10 minutes for me to start sharing everything. Uh, I don't really have a producer or anything like that, so I don't have anybody kind of sh helping me share this into the groups and all that sort of jazz that I that I normally need to to share it into in order to in order to make sure that my content is actually seen, is visible by human eyes. Uh, because uh, a lot of times, in a lot of instances, when it comes to Facebook and Twitter, they will not uh, they will not show this content to people. Uh, a lot of times, they don't even notify that my content goes out to people. So, uh, for those that are just tuning in, hang in there. Don't leave. Uh, we are going to be talking about our big topics of the day here. In just a few short minutes, once we get uh, all of our shares done, and like always, I always encourage uh, viewers to hit the like button, hit the share button, make sure that uh, that folks know that we are doing this, and uh, that we're we're covering some topics that you probably won't see or hear in corporate mainstream media, because topics like this are often. Uh, suppressed, manipulated, or uh, gaslit, as you as as we will get into uh, in our story today. So um, yeah, I hope um, I hope you guys will hang out for a little bit. Like I said, this takes like ten ish minutes or so, and then I do my little announcements, and then we we dive into these stories. But at the top of the show, um, I do a little check in, let you guys know what's going on with me. What's coming up down the pipeline? Um, I am using a new browser for this, which which is why it kind of took me. I, I normally try to get these things rolling by twelve fifteen so that I can do these. Um, I can do these shares, and by twelve thirty, when people kind of know to join in, the shares are done. And and I don't need to like overly concerned uh, be be concerned about like oh man, am I, you know. Am I going to lose a bunch of people because the first 10 minutes of this is me sharing and talking about it? So um, hopefully this will also resolve a lot of the crashing problems. I talked to Lee Camp, Ron Placone, and Graham Elwood about what they use for their streaming, and they also use StreamYard. Um, so I was, I was kind of getting figuring out what browser they use, and, and everybody kind of basically said that the, you know Chrome was the way to go. Uh, unfortunately, and uh, they, you know, they primarily just use it for streaming because it's got better streaming capabilities than some of the other browsers. Uh, and I have contacted Opera to let them know that it seems like this is a browser issue, and and hopefully they'll they'll find some bugs and fix those bugs <clears throat> so that you know I can can I can go back to just using one browser. And and for and for the people that use Opera, uh, you know, like I don't know I don't know how many Opera users I have um that tune into the show but i really like it and like i said like this is like the first time that i've really faced a whole lot of problems with opera and you know it's it's a little it's a little perturbing little perturbing uh to to say the least that uh it would give me some trouble and i mean i stopped using chrome because it because it just was giving me a lot of issues so similar to what opera was giving me where like videos wouldn't play properly and it would crash all the time. So uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to go to a different um, different browser that wouldn't do that, and Opera was that for a little while, but obviously we have been dealing with some issues uh, there. So 
Um, so hopefully this kind of takes care of that problem. Yesterday, if you if you tuned in yesterday to the uh, the podcast I put out with Nico House, uh, that's available wherever you listen to podcasts and also on Rockfin. Um, yesterday was my comedy anniversary, sixteen years, uh, which is which is pretty exciting. Um, and uh, I'm gr- I'm really terrible at celebrating those things, so I just told folks to either purchase my album and if you uh, purchase my albums off a of Bandcamp, uh, which if you have done, then I, I basically suggested that you make a donation to a mutual aid in your community, because that is uh, that is the way that we will that is the way that I think we'll be moving forward in terms of taking care of each other when uh, when our governments don't. Um, don't take care of us. So, um, I think I think this is all of. Yeah. Okay. This is the last group to share into Facebook here. But um, yeah. So I, 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 you know, that's basically what I told some folks to do. So if you're if you're interested, then uh, I would recommend you know share it, it, going to my Bandcamp page and 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 downloading an album or 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 whatever. And most of my stuff on Bandcamp is available for a buck, so not too expensive, um, you know. And and you can pay more if you would like to, but I know everybody's kind of struggling right now, so that's why I have it up for a buck. And and again, a lot of my stuff on Bandcamp is also available for pay what you want, which is basically means that it's also available for free. Um, just because I want people to enjoy the content if they want to enjoy it if they want to enjoy the album they want i want people to just be able to enjoy it without having to worry about you know how much it's going to cost can i afford it you know is this is, is this expense something i can take into uh, into account this month and uh so on and so forth so that's why that's why i decided to do the pay what you want model oh right facebook it's changed the way that they do shit. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, next week, we'll have a new schedule coming up. It'll it'll be the official start of the new schedule, which means that these live streams... So this is probably going to be the last Friday live stream that... Um, uh, that, I'll, that I'll be doing going forward. And I'll kind of explain why. Uh, it's, I got a new job... And that means that I got to get up at five in the morning, um, starting next week and I'll be done by like one thirty, which is kind of great. Um, and that also means that I will have the afternoon. I'm still taking care of the elderly lady twice a week in the evening. So Tuesdays and Wednesdays are going to be kind of crazy. Um, but that means that I'm going to switch my live stream schedule to, uh, three o'clock Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 3 PM. That's when I'll be doing the live streams. And then uh, on Thursdays will be the release of Taboo Table Talk. Uh, Friday will be the release of The Dispatch. And then I, I kind of will have just Saturday, Sunday to just have a Saturday, Sunday. Uh, every so often, I'll probably do a Saturday live stream every so often, not all the time, right? Uh, just because I don't want to go too crazy with it. Um uh, I'm splitting the Taboo Table Talks and the Dispatches as well. They're going to be under the same banner of Taboo Table Talk, but uh, Taboo Table Talk will primarily just be the interviews, and then there will be, like, the Taboo Table Talk Dispatch, which will be, like, the more current event stories that I cover and write about, uh, you know, so similar to, like, what Lee Camp does with his segments on Redacted Tonight. So that'll be one. So, so those will be two separate podcasts, so I can kind of have one more focused on the interview and more focused on the conversation and have one more focused on news stories. So those are some of the schedule changes that I'm, that I'm coming up with. I'm also like, I'm, I, I also mentioned this yesterday in the podcast is I'm going to release a statement of transparency so that, you know, um, you guys, if, when you guys make donations, uh, if, and when you guys make donations, um, you know, exactly what you're donating to, you know, exactly, uh, what the goals of 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 uh, 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 what my goals are for for these channels for the for the content that I'm releasing, um, and no one's kept in the dark. So if that is something that you would like to contribute to, you know um, exactly how much is being contributed, and and the goals that I'm trying to achieve with it. So the closer we get to that, the more I'll be able to able to do. So so hopefully the, those things will be uh, you know 
hopefully that'll happen sooner rather than later. But I'm going to put those statements of statement of transparency up this weekend. Um, so yeah, uh, be on the lookout for those. So let's dive in. Uh, let's do our quick little announcements up at the top of the show. Uh, if you are on stable financial ground and want to make a contribution to the show, you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. You can become a sustaining member, make monthly contributions, uh, which gets you free tickets to virtual and uh, when live comedy shows come back, live shows that I produce, uh, you get free tickets to those. You also get bonus stand-up comedy content. You get early access to certain videos. You get uh, material that nobody hears. You get to ask me questions, send me articles, um, ask me about my thoughts, and I will respond to them um, on either you know a live video, the virtual shows, or a separate video in and of itself and release them as premium content. That is something I will do. So uh, the way that works is um, I send out an email every month to the sustaining members with all of their bonus content and you can respond directly to that email uh so you can respond directly to that email or leave a comment on that email uh so that's how that works uh another way that you can become a sustaining member is by endorsing my channel on rockfin.com which will give you access to not just my premium content but for premium content to every single content creator on rockfin which is awesome uh rockfin is the crypto blockchain site that is uh, fighting back against censorship by helping content creators do what they do, which is earn an income by creating content. Uh, so I, I, I am encouraging more people to migrate towards Rockfin at rockfin.com slash Krishmohan. Ha ha. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, if you are, uh, a, if you want to sign up for my free email list, you can do so at krishmohanhaha.substack.com. Each week I send out an email uh, with a list of all of the videos and podcasts that I have released for that week. So if that is of interest to you, then uh, go on and, uh, and join that email list. It's a good time. It's, uh, and, and again, it's just once a week and it's totally free. There is a paid version to that email list that uh, that, that you can subscribe to. And when, when you do get join the paid version, you will uh, get the member emails as well which is pretty exciting. So uh, I also encourage people to leave comments. When you leave comments, I will uh, be able to see them um, and I will be able to put them up on the screen and uh, I will, you know, I'll, I'll read and respond to them. Uh, so those are some things that we can do. So I, but I will read them at the end of the segment, not at the beginning or, or like as comments come through, it's difficult to keep up with the comments and keep up with what I'm trying to talk about. So without me trying to lose my head over it, uh, I will respond to the comments at the end of each segment uh, and try not to be a dick in the comments. Uh, usually I don't have a problem with that, but you never know. Uh, so with all that said and done, I think now is the time that we dive into our Stories of the day. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this whole idea that Biden's building a wall. Or he said that he was, you know, there's there's claims that he's going to uh, restart the border wall. And uh, what's funny about that is in August, he denounced building the wall. He denounced the wall period on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and he said he was going to get going to get rid of land seizures. Right there, the Texas had a problem where um, people were getting their their land seized. Um, uh, people are going to get their land seized, and uh, and then they and then they build a bunch of shit. Um, you know, they build like a wall, they build a fence, they build something like that on people's property that they have seized. This is. This is how it used to work. So he basically said he was going to cancel all of that kind of shit. Uh, but he lied because he is going to he is is planning on rebuilding that wall. And what he claims he's doing is, oh, but he's just building up the, the holes that are in the existing walls. That's what he's trying to do. Right. Because, oh, we have a border crisis. We have a crisis at the border. There's 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 all of these refugees coming to America. Because America is fucked with their country. <laughs> And they're coming over here looking for, like, a new life. Oh, no! <laughs> which is which is total bullshit, right? Like, if you, if you actively fuck with another country, if you actively 
put uh, install a dictator in a country so that you can economically benefit from it, uh, you know, uh, where and the casualty of um, of that country is its people, uh, then uh, you got to take the refugees that come along with it. That should just be a fucking rule. If you want to run psyops to fucking destroy another country, you should take oh, you should take that country's refugees. If you wage war against another country, you should take that country's refugees. Perhaps then it will prevent U.S. imperialism from fucking with other countries. The question always remains, right, when all this stuff happens is they go, oh, you know, the, the narrative always spins to, oh, well, they're coming over here because, you know, life is better in the United States, but they got to come over here the right way. They got to come over here the way that the United States tells you you can come over here, which basically means you have to be a rich, uh, rich immigrant or at least an upper middle class immigrant. Uh, the people that are truly suffering in these countries that are looking for a better life, that are working really hard in their country, that come over here and work doubly hard in America, uh, you know, they have to kind of have some income already. And you have to be the model immigrant, which means what? Which means that you don't criticize the Democratic Party, which means that you don't, uh, you, you, you know, you don't push back against the establishment. You follow the rules and you be the token. You followed when you fall in line with all of the stereotypes. You don't call out blatant racism from liberals. You don't call out blatant racism uh, and, and disrespect from from, uh, you know, the quote left like the faux, the faux left. Right. Um uh, and uh, and you be the good little immigrant, because if you're not the good little immigrant, if you're not the immigrant that's that likes to get tousled on the head and is basically a Chuck Lorre fucking stereotype of, oh, man, the brown immigrant boy is afraid of girls. Ooh, scary girls. And let's respect the, the hijab, but also still show what a makeover looks like. If you're not playing that part, then then we got to build a ball and we got to fucking, you know, keep you out of the country. But that's but that's the lie that's sold to us, right? Is is like it, people don't come here because they're quote you know looking for the American dream. They just don't want to be in a, a dictatorship anymore. And you can make the arguments whether America is or isn't a dictatorship. Uh, but people people very likely like people don't want to leave their country of origin. People don't want to leave their homes, right? Especially when you are someone that has built a life in a particular country. Now, I, I moved here when I was eight years old. So, you know, I didn't really have a crazy attachment in life to to India. I mean, I, I have memories there. I have family there. I, I do have a sense of nostalgia for India, but I didn't build a life. I didn't, I didn't build a family. You know, I, I hadn't been working at a job. I hadn't uh, made loads and loads of friends yet. You know, I was in that awkward transitionary period, but my parents did. And so for my parents to come here, there has to be a good reason to. Now, in, in lots of ways, you can come here with like a visa, right? You can come here with like a visa or, or be sponsored for a green card, so on and so forth. Various different ways that you can make it here. But usually when it's my it, when it's migrants coming here, not, you know, the, the quote undocumented immigrants, which is who get demonized the most in this argument, uh, they come here. Because they're trying to escape trouble. That's 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 the reason why animals migrate. Whenever whenever there is trouble, whenever there is there are problems with where you're at, you have to migrate to a new to new place. Uh, like animal migration happens when you run out of resources in a particular area, right? When they've kind of eaten all the food and you know have kind of, have have run out of water supply and there is higher predators in that area, then it's time to move. It's time to keep moving because, you know, and then they'll come back again to the next, you know, the next year and stuff. But it's the same reason why human beings would migrate, right? Human beings migrate because their resources are in trouble. In their in their countries in Central, Central and Latin America, a lot of these countries have been fucked with by U.S. imperialism. Their resources aren't, uh, being divvied up the right way. There is a dictatorship in place. There is a, a military authoritarian government in place. Uh, and these people are looking for just something better than that, which happens to be the United States. And they come through here and they don't have the money to go through the legal channels. And by the way, the legal channels, being that someone that, being someone that has gone through every level of the legal channel of being in this country, it's a fucking mess. It is long. It is uh, inconvenient. 
It is meant to be that way. It is expensive. It is not easy to navigate. Uh, you know, you need an immigration lawyer, so you got to pay for an immigration lawyer to do the right paperwork. You have to get visas renewed if, if you're on a visa program. Even if you're on a green card, every 10 years, you have to get that renewed. Um, and again, all of that is dependent on you being the model immigrant, right? If you have any sort of discrepancy with the law at all, it could jeopardize the whole process. So, you know, it's not easy to be an immigrant, period. It's even harder to be an undocumented immigrant. And these undocumented immigrants that are coming through don't have the luxury of, um, like, I consider myself lucky that I had the luxury of waiting for years on end without my life being in, in immediate, you know, immediate volatile danger. I wasn't trying to escape a coup. I wasn't trying to escape a, a military dictatorship. I came here because my dad came here and, you know, everything was kind of depend on my dad and I don't have a great relationship with him. But, you know, that's, I consider myself lucky in that sense. But these people don't have the time to go through bureaucracy and figure out a lawyer and make sure that they have $10,000 saved up and they can figure out how to get here. Like, we were lucky to be able to afford plane tickets and an apartment and all that kind of shit here. These people don't have that luxury. So if you're a country that fucks with other countries, then you should expect refugees and you should fucking take them into your country. Human beings migrate when when there is exploitation wars economic strife all caused by other human beings that's when people migrate to a different country and all of this is beneficial to capitalism it's all beneficial to capitalism because capitalism thrives capitalism wants the undocumented immigrant but in order but it can't just come out and be like hey this is good for us because we get to exploit the fucking shit out of them uh, and and then we get to use them as a negotiating tool to ensure wage slavery for you know the 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 working class of America. They can't just outright come out and say it. So so they have to spin it to be like, oh look, these undocumented immigrants are stealing your jobs. That's how they frame it. They're stealing your jobs. When in reality, uh, the the problems lie in. And the fact that corporations are hiring undocumented immigrants to work on factory floors, to work, you know, at meat processing plants, to work at Amazon warehouses. And who gets punished for it? It's not the corporation that hired them. It's the immigrant themselves. And it's the working class beside them. These immigrants work for way less than minimum wage because what are they going to do? Who are they going to report to? Because if they report it to somebody, then they might get in trouble for being in this country undocumented. Right? So who's the victim in this situation? It's an exploitative system. So capitalism fucking loves it because now they get to pay less than minimum wage for a bunch of employees, not cover any sort of, not give them any sort of benefits. And don't, they don't have to worry about health coverage or any of that sort of shit. And, and they get to use it as a negoti negotiating point, right? Like if, if there is some kind of worker uprising where let's say at the Tyson's food plant, they're like, we're going to go on strike because we want hazard pay. They'll be like, fine, go on hazard pay. We can hire some undocumented workers that'll, that'll work for uh, a third of what you normally make. And the company turns over a profit anyway. So fuck off. So they get to use immigrants as, a, and, and then that creates, that creates the divide, right? That creates the divide of like, oh, they're stealing the jobs. But who gets in trouble? It's always the working class, whether you're an undocumented worker or you're, you're an American worker, it doesn't matter. The working class is the victim in the immigration crisis along with the immigrants so if you're if you are a factory worker if you are uh you know someone that works in the, uh, in an assembly line or a meat packing plant or whatever you should be siding with the immigrants you should be saying that you know you know what the undocumented immigrants don't deserve to be exploited that way and neither do we and we're going to stand in solidarity with them and take care of each other and 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 say fuck you to the boss that doesn't want to give us a living wage
So this fight for borders just becomes a, a exploitative control point for capitalism. That's really what it boils down to. And the immigration system is a total, total fucking mess. It needs to be completely overhauled at this point. It's an administrative problem that you're trying to solve with with a fucking wall by putting by by torturing migrant children by putting them in cages, and that is what he's doing. By the way, that is what Joe Biden is doing. He is still putting them in cages. You can call them immigrant detention centers, or what the fuck did they call them? There's there's something in Dallas called the immigrant decompression centers. That's what they call them, which is like a very clockwork orange way to fucking put that, isn't it? We're going to decompress the immigrants. It either it either sounds like they're they're like taping their eyes open and making them watch every fucking Stallone, Seagal and Van Damme movie from the 80s that show America is the most powerful, even though most of those people are not American. Right. Like like all of the American heroes that they championed, like Van Damme's, I think, Belgian the Schwarzenegger is is Austrian, uh, you know, and then you have Carl Weathers, who's a black dude like that's, you know, as if black people are respected in America. All of a sudden, when you can use them as your action hero to promote some sort of like capitalist domination. Oh, all of a sudden, strong black people are American now. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But the point, the whole point of this is like, yeah, the 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 border crisis is kept a crisis because it splits the working class. And guess who gets to who gets to reap the rewards of undocumented workers? Corporations. That's who gets to reap the benefits of it. So all of this is is all pro business stuff. That's really what it is. That's really all it is. Cool. Uh, popping over to check out some comments. <laughs> Aiden says, <laughs> but I want to be a dick. You're not my supervisor. <laughs> this is true. I'm not your supervisor. Uh, so Zivik's saying your last stream is still up. Uh, yes, two Krish live streams. True, true. <laughs> oh, no. So I guess I guess my uh, there was a discrepancy in my last live stream from uh, from Tuesday and uh, uh, where my, you know, the whole thing fucking crashed and uh uh i had to like restart the stream and there was there was a weird thing that happened so i guess i guess rockman is still claiming that i'm live when i'm not and it has been for the last three days uh so i mean the streams are the streams are always up for folks to check out afterwards uh because they do that replay thing but i guess it's still up from that glitch that happened uh, which is fine because I know Rockfin is new, so you know this is a problem that they'll have to address and fix at some other point, unfortunately. Uh, but let's let's head over to our second story to cover for the day. We are going to be facing an eviction epidemic here pretty soon, and Eleanor Goldfield, which is the article that I'm going to you know uh, read through here in, in a in a little bit. Uh, to talk about some of the key points uh, that she addresses. It's a, it's a fantastic article on Mint Press News. Uh, so you guys should go check that out if you if you would like to. I'm going to read read some of it here for you guys. But we are we are hitting that point where we're going to see a lot of evictions across the country. Um, 22 million households. That's households. Not 22 million people. We're talking about 22 million households, which at minimum is 88 million people. Minimum 88 million. If you're a house of four, right? It, households are usually families of four. Like a family of four, would be, that would mean 88 million people. Can't afford food in America because the pandemic has caused us to lose a lot of our livelihoods. Um you know, and it has put a lot of us at risk of losing our shelter, our food, our health, our water, all of our basic needs. All, again, going back to jobs, right? Going back to labor. This is why labor is so important uh, and why capitalists feel like they need to exploit it because labor has become the central focal point of how we get our basic needs met. Um, and when you can control labor, then you can control basic needs. And that's kind of the way that capitalism is working at this point. 
uh, even though basic needs uh, are should be a guarantee in our society and not something you have to fight for or, quote, earn, uh, which is how it is, which is why 22 million households, households in America cannot afford food. Uh, now, that is it is twice as bad for black and Latino families than it is for white families because of systemic racism, uh, because of the issues within, you know, th that are more specific to uh, through ethnic communities, through through minor to, to minority communities as well. Now, one out of six Americans can't afford rent. And once again, uh, it's the same thing. Right. It's twice as bad for black and Latino families because some of these landlords that are delivering evictions and going through with them are racist. Uh, and we also have a racist criminal justice system because uh, the people that are are, are uh, enforcing the e evictions are sheriff's offices. So, uh, you know, and, and we all know that the cop, the police force, uh, the police system, the police organization, the police gang, whatever the fuck you want to call it, are racist. Uh, that is that is kind of not up for debate. That's just what it is. <laughs> uh, so what what do we do from here? Is you know there there are eviction moratoriums, but there's a lot of problems within the eviction moratoriums. And we're going to talk about that. There's food programs in place, but there's a lot of problems with the food programs in place. And and the biggest way that you can kind of alleviate this problem, the biggest way that you can alleviate. Uh, the eviction epidemic that we are about to go into is pretty simple. You cancel rents. You cancel rents and mortgages, right? So, so now even if you're a small business uh, or or like a small time landlord, right? You only have one or two properties. Like the, like this this place we live in is is um, owned by a just just some regular average folks that know how to do some home fix em ups. Or, or connected to folks that know how to do home fix em ups, right? So they can kind of own property and take care of the house and so on and so forth. And they do probably, you know, either break even or turn a profit from this from this property. But let's say they get a, 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 a mortgage uh, cancellation. That until the end of the pandemic, until it is absolutely safe for people to work and do all the things and yada, 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 uh, that there is no rent and mortgage. Uh, and that is co and that is compounded by the fact that the banks already got a six trillion dollar bailout. There, that already happened. So why do they need our money still? So, on top of this, there should be a debt moratorium. If you are in debt, it's part of that six trillion dollars just cleared out your debt. Why am I still paying money to a bank that already has a fuck ton of money? Doesn't make any fucking sense, does it? So why did you guys give? So so really, that's the that's the answer. You cancel the rents. People don't have to stress out about it. They still have shelter. You can stop the spread of uh, COVID nineteen, which which in the homeless community does spread pretty voraciously and quickly, because they don't have a way to protect themselves from this thing because they don't have shelter and they don't have access to clean water or food or 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 bathing. Or PPEs or any of that sort of stuff. This is unscientific to to still dish out eviction notices to people. Oh, I mean, going beyond the the moral arguments of it, right? Because the hardcore capitalists and the Republicans and the conservatives, you know, those folks are going to sit there and make the argument that, oh, well, they fucked up in their lives, and if they can't afford their home, they can't afford their homes. Too bad, so sad. Go fuck yourself. This is, you know, you got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps in the freest country in the world. This country is made great because of wage slavery. But cancel the it's it, it, cancel the rents is a organized movement. It's not something willy nilly. Like you can't just be like, I cancel the rents, and like it's not. You're not Michael Scott from The Office just yelling the word bankruptcy and now you've declared it, right? Um, it's an organized way to push back against evictions during this pandemic. That means that if you live in a community, if you live in a, a you know, in a in a in a apartment complex or apartment building or something like that, you all get together and you push back against the landlord and say, look, we're we're not paying our rent, we're we're not paying any back rent, we're we're demanding that you cancel this rent. That's the only way to make this work. 
And whatever bank you have a loan with, they cancel your moratorium because they already got bailed out. It also advocates for the fact that housing is a human right. It's a human right, which means that everybody that's unhoused, the fact that America and, and a lot of other countries have unhoused people on the street, a lot of whom have not made that choice for themselves, a lot of whom are homeless because of economic circumstances out of their control, that's a human rights violation. And right now, America is choosing to create its own homeless, like it always has. But now it's just doing it outright. Now it's just doing it in your face. And because it's organized, it, it shows that through solidarity and mutual aid, and there's a lot of mutual aid uh, groups and organizations that have started partnering with cancel the rent movements. You can take care of each other. People can actually thrive in a mutual aid community. It's about solidarity, not charity. It's about doing what's right for the community. It's about making sure that people are taken care of. Everybody is taken care of, not just people that fit a certain uh, you know, list of rules and regulations. Everybody gets taken care of. That's true equality. And that doesn't come from capitalism. That comes from ca so solidarity through socialism. Now, like I said, there's also people going hungry. And um, there was a food box program, a farm to kind of like a farm to table kind of program where, I mean, my neighborhood did it, where, where every week we would go and we would get some food. It would have produce, cheese, milk, uh, some meat, uh, fruits, vegetables, um, you know, sometimes bread. It had various different things. And it was basically stuff that, that farms weren't able to send to wholesale retailers. Restaurants weren't getting a, as much food, you know, from farmers anymore. Um, grocery stores were kind of in that same boat. So they were like, well, let's just give it directly to the people, right? And, and they're, you know, so, so Trump created this program. And now Biden's killing the program. He's getting rid of it. Why? Because, oh man, there were some places that had spoiled food and dairy products, right? Some of the meat and, and dairy products went bad in some of these places, or they had some transportation issues in some of these places. Uh, and, oh, and then this is hilarious too, is in certain cases, it was too expensive to keep the program going because corporations that the farmers had to use to deliver their the, the, the produce to these communities were overcharging them for distribution. They were overcharging the USDA. Now, the USDA's default was to tell these farmers to dump their food. So these farmers are still doing their jobs, and the USDA's direction was dump the milk and get rid of the food. So they're just throwing food away instead of feeding Americans. So eventually, they started feeding Americans, and it was a program that was helping. I mean, we saw how many food lines there were across this country. So th th there's a routers piece that talks about this, right? And routers basically frames it as, oh man, look how terrible Trump was at uh, at giving food to Americans. Like some of the food got spoiled. These corporations, can you believe that these corporations actually overcharged the USDA? Fucking yeah, because even Biden approved a bunch of the corporate loopholes that they're utilizing. There's no, there's no regulation for them. And Biden championed that shit. Ah, let's do it. This is what happens in capitalism. This is what happens when capitalism runs a system. When you have assistance programs, they take advantage of it. Because capitalism is an opportunistic parasite. No fucking shit. This had, and yes, did, could Trump have done something better for it? Absolutely. But isn't, isn't Biden supposed to be the anti-Trump? He's supposed to be the antidote to all of Trumpism? Isn't that what the liberals tout? Isn't that what Democrats have been saying this whole fucking time? And instead of fixing the problem within the system, instead of fixing the logistical issues within the system, he's just going to get rid of it. 
because it's more, quote, cost effective to throw all of it away than to pay somebody to distribute it and get it to, directly to the uh, homes of starving Americans. This system doesn't give a shit. Joe Biden doesn't give a shit because Joe Biden is an agent of capitalism. And he is more concerned about the bottom line than he is anything else. He's canceling the program, right? Biden decided to cancel food instead of cancel rents. That's what capitalism does. Which just means that it is possible to cancel rents. He can make that shit happen. But he just, there's just no political will to get it done. Because they want people in this situation. What, what, I mean, this is a total and utter mismanagement of trying to take care of Americans and feed them. What these moratoriums do is that they're, they delay it. They, it's a stopgap measure at best. That's what it is. There's an accumulation of rent. There's a back pay and it puts people into debt. And that's how capitalism operates it's a culture of debt that's all it is it's an economy based on debt everybody needs to be in some form of debt that's how you have good credit by the way when you have a lot of debt that you are slowly paying off where where more of it is interest payments than it is actual principal payments that means you have good credit i paid off my student loans early and i had a financial advisor once tell me that was a bad idea because my credit isn't going to go it's not going to look good on my credit when you have debt you have good how much sense does that actually fucking make but capitalism thrives on it that's why we invented that's why it invented the credit system to begin with so that it could increase the cost of shit and regardless of what happens everybody makes more money out of it except you the consumer except you the working class consumer you get fucked over and and it's an exploitative thing and it puts a price tag on every fucking thing that if you can't afford it then you can get it on credit be in debt forever but you still get to enjoy that thing and now they're doing it for food and shelter they're doing it to basic fucking needs that should be guaranteed as a human being which means capitalism is is violating human rights just by sh the sheer notion of its existence Uh, I want to I want to um, get into this story, but I, I I know you guys have been leaving comments, so I want to take a look. I know Zozovix has left a couple comments. Uh, he says if if they paid people two k a month, this wouldn't be happening, which is why they didn't. You will own nothing and be happy being owned. Uh, so sixteen percent can't afford rent. That's uh, of adults fifty million directly, but at least fifty million indirectly counting children uh as well could be looking at 50 million homeless yeah ex absolutely and and like you said if they would have done two thousand dollar payments every month this wouldn't be an issue because uh, i mean a good portion of that would have probably gone to paying rents depending on where you live i live in pittsburgh so i would say about a quarter of that would have gone into paying rent for me you know but i know in other states it's probably uh either all of it or most of it would be going to like New York City. It's most of it. San Diego is all of it. Um, and it is it is. Cre we don't own anything. We're going to be in debt, you know, and what really sucks is if you're a family of four living in a two bedroom apartment. Well, that's it. I, that's that's where you live. If you want to keep a roof over your head and a roof for your children, then that is where you live forever. There's no expanding. There's no growing into a, a nest egg. You don't get to own property. It's either that or you or, or you do you do what those of was venturing 50 million homeless uh banks will all buy up all that property for pennies on the dollar and sell it back to some government housing program the indentured servitude of paying mortgages will begin anew in my lifetime i've watched the cost of living quadruple my father has watched it six tuple at least uh people that say that are brainwashed uh yeah it's it the cost. I mean, I've watched the cost of living go up. They were talking about it on NBC the other day, where they were like, "Oh, look at the cost of things going up. Isn't it crazy? 
What? Oh man, eggs the eggs are costing like over a dollar fifty now. And bread is getting crazy, and a gallon of milk is more than a gallon of gas. That's so nuts. What's happening to the world? Whoa! Not mentioning the fact that, you know, minimum wage is the same. Uh, we haven't actually given economic relief to working class Americans in this country. They just ignore all that, and they go, oh, man, isn't it nuts? What a crazy thing. Whoa, man. Ah, oh, that's... Boy, it's, it's sad. This is... The producers are telling me it's sad. I'm an NBC reporter, so I actually don't know how to process my feelings un unless GE tells me how to process my feelings and what I'm supposed to feign to the American working class. The crux of the problem is the prices are going up while the cost of living has basically stayed the same, further put putting more Americans into poverty. Further creating a more further exacerbating the housing crisis. Uh, okay, so I do want to read a portion of this article here. All right. So this is this is uh, Eleanor Goldfield is is writing this and and we'll break we'll break this down as we kind of go along here, but I wanted to get to some comments before I did this part. Uh, she, this is, this uh, section is titled a Morator moratorium full of holes. Here's some, I point to the eviction moratorium as proof that we, uh, we have that at least we, uh, sorry. I don't know why I had a problem reading that sentence. Here's some, I point to the eviction moratorium as proof that we at least have that covered. Allow me to unceremoniously burst your bubble. According to the tracking by the eviction lab at Princeton University. During the pandemic, landlords have filed for over 284,490 eviction, and that's just in five states and 27 cities. But how could this be? After all, a moratorium shouldn't allow for hundreds of thousands of households to fall through the cracks. Well, let's just say that, quote, moratorium is a misnomer. This moratorium is more like a bottleneck on a freeway it'll eventually let up but things are just a little slowed down right now what should have been a fierce and clear cut roadblock allows for landlords to evict tenants for reasons other than non-payment in places where leases have to be renewed by the landlord they can just choose not to remove re renew them Furthermore, the burden lies on the tenant to provide the landlord with a CDC signed declaration that took me, a journalist, 10 minutes to find online when I already knew what I was looking for. At, at least we forget internet access is, is not a luxury every American can afford. So again, how many people, I, I'm, until I read this article, I didn't know about the CDC declaration. Uh, and she and, and like she points out, it took her 10 minutes to find and she knew what she was looking for and it still took her that long to find. Yeah. Uh, and Internet access is a luxury. It, uh, it, it shouldn't be. A, it should be a, a basic need that's covered at this point, uh, you know, which is why we need municipal broadband in a lot of cities. But a, a lot of places don't have Internet access. A lot of places could, you know, a lot of people can't afford Internet access because even. Um, Even if you lived in like in a household that maybe had their rents covered, their internet wasn't. I mean, Comcast was basically like, okay, you can't pay your rent next, you can't pay the bill this month. We'll do the same thing that we're doing with the rents. We'll just create a moratorium, and then you'll owe Comcast a buttload of money. Over 52 households earning less than $25,000 own and use a computer, and uh, as reported by Truthco, 78% of white, 68% of African Americans, and 66% of Latinos use the internet. In rural areas, though, however, only 70% of white Americans had adopted the uh, internet compared to 59% of African Americans and 61% of Latinos. In other words, that online decoration form might as well be Willy Wonka's golden ticket. Indeed, just knowing that you need to fill out a declaration is a fact seemingly more well guarded than KFC's secret sauce recipe. I, I like the I, I very much enjoy the way that Eleanor writes. Uh, 
Age and gender also play a role here. When taken all together, the most marginalized people are the most at risk of being evicted simply because they don't have access to information about the measly protections available to them. And this goes for a lot of things, by the way. That's not just for rents. I mean, there's probably a lot of stuff that we can take protections for that we aren't even told about or isn't easily accessible or if it is easy, if it is known about is is still kind of difficult to access. Landlords take advantage of this information gap and move forward through the eviction proceedings into which thousands have fallen. After all, landlords can still file for eviction. Step two in the five-step process of eviction, notice, filing, hearing, court decision, and enforcement. So people can see that the notice on their front door and thinks it, think it's all over when in fact it's only just begun. That being said, many courthouses are moving forward with eviction proceedings in several states. Governors and state legislatures have effectively refused to pause evictions. So once you're in the process, you're in the process. I kind of knew about the five-step process. I knew that it was kind of a long process to go through. Um, but how many other people did? I didn't know the exact process until I read this article. So here, here's, here's the other part of it, right? Check this. Out. So she says, for example, here in D.C., a superior court judge ruled back in December that legislation passed by the D.C. Council earlier this year Banning landlords from filing eviction proceedings is unconstitutional and violates property owners' rights. So landlords are free to file away, leading to instances, as noted above, where people think they have to leave their homes in the midst of a pandemic. Fast forward to today, when the D.C. City Council voted to pass a bill that would allow landlords to evict tenants who pose a, quote, current and substantial threat to their neighbors, household members, and building slap, with housing advocates concerned that this will be used against any tenants that landlords want to get rid of, not uh, at least of all tenant organizers and those who have been able to pay rent. So basically, if you're one of these people that are on an evic, uh, uh, you know, kind of in your homes because of an eviction moratorium, it doesn't matter. The landlord can choose not to renew your lease, which means that they can file an eviction notice anyway because they didn't renew a lease and you don't have a lease in the building now. Um, or they'll just file it anyway, and the courts will take the side of the landlords. A lot of these rules are written so that the, it's it's weighted heavily to favor the landlords over the tenants in some of these cases. Um, so, you know, the, the, them saying it's a current and substantial threat is just a, a circumvent way of saying, okay, there's an eviction moratorium, but we can say, oh, well, you know, this uh, black family is, uh, it, it's, they're, they're, they're threatening in their demeanor and, and, you know, we just don't feel safe having them in the building. Or this Latino family seems to be too large for the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the apartment that they're in. There's, there's f five or six of them in a two-bedroom apartment. That's so crazy. Oh, my goodness. Which is ridiculous because when I was a kid, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment in India with six people. And guess what? It wasn't like this unsanitary cesspool, cesspool, right? We weren't getting fucking diphtheria every week. Like, we knew how to fucking clean a house. And there were more hands involved. So it was actually cleaner than most houses. Like, we have a hard time. There's three of us living in this house. And we have a hard time keeping up with, with our jobs, right? Which, like, I have three of. Uh, uh, my housemate has a job and he, he has a, uh, uh, he's, he's a content producer as well. Uh, my other housemate has, has a, a job and, and takes care of this house on top of which she runs a, a radio network and is a, is a, a community organizer. She does a bunch of shit in the community. On top of that, we have to take care of this house. Do you know how hard that is? But if you have six people living there, there's other members of the family that can also help out. That's how a fucking community works. But that's not what they're trying to advocate for here. So they make the claims like, oh, this is a substantial threat because, oh, my God, they have more people living in a house or an apartment than than it, it legally, quote, legally says it should. Oh, it's a sanitation problem. No, it's not. It's really fucking not. So they're going to use this current and substantial threat to circumvent the eviction moratoriums to kick out people. And again, they'll probably use racial stereotypes in order to do that. And again, as we've seen from the the cases uh, involving killer cops, 
racism is, is an accepted defense. You can use racial stereotypes as a defense to basically prove, you know, uh, to, to, to validate injustices across the country. That is something that we've seen. So if it works in, in, in a case uh, for a killer cop, there's no reason why it wouldn't work here. Um, so going forward, so... Um, this bill put forward by council member Anita Bonds is backed by the city's rental housing strike force, a council put together by Mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser to address tenant landlord issues that is suspiciously lacking in tenant voices, centering instead the voices and interests of landlords and developers. Ultimately, the bill passed with some amendments requiring for, for instance, the alternative housing to be secured in some cases prior to eviction, but housing advocates remain wary of the manifold opportunities for landlords to abuse this bill. Uh, cool. So moving forward, she talks about other states that are doing this, right? So DC is hardly alone uh, in its struggles against vague and weak moratoriums. In Idaho, tenants have tried to use the moratorium as a defense to have judges knock it down as invalid or insufficient. As the Idaho statement, statement statesman reported in late March, the Boise-based nonprofit Jesse Tree, which uh, Jesse Tree, which works with folks facing eviction, says they've seen the moratorium successfully used as a defense in not only one one case out of hundreds, and that person was ultimately evicted anyway. So I guess not all that successful. In Akron, Ohio, a couple who are both battling stage four cancer was evicted by a Zoom court proceedings because the, their landlord sold property, yet another glaring loophole in the moratorium. A fellow Akron resident didn't know uh, she had to bring that shifty CDC declaration to court, so her eviction proceeding went a a ahead as well. So again, that piece of paperwork is is in, like impeding people uh, from not getting evicted. From, from having these these moratoriums, which when they work are just stopgap measures anyway, from actually working. And not just that, if you miss these court proceedings over Zoom, then you're, you're double fucked anyway. And again, we go, we talked about how internet is a luxury. In certain places, it, you can't afford internet. There's kids whose parents can't afford the internet, so they have to sit outside Starbucks and McDonald's to do their homework. And in the winter time, or or on a day like today when it's raining outside, that's so that's insanely difficult to do. This is th this is affecting poor, low income communities more than it is any other community. So they're using online evictions as a way to. To get rid of people, right? Uh, I'm going to move to the next section here. Uh, and yet these are just official court proceedings. As far more insidious beast lies in the informal eviction, a.k.a. illegal, a.k.a. self-help, which is what it's really called. Here in D.C., while landlords are allowed to move forward with the official filings, tenants are, for now, supposed, supposedly protected from being evicted until moratorium is lifted. Well, words like official and supposedly don't mean much when you come from a come to uh, come home to find that the landlord has changed the locks on your front door. Here again, landlords take advantage of the fact that so many of these low income tenants don't have access to information that would protect them from their landlord's illegal actions. Immigrant renters and those without immigration status are at particularly high risk, as many of them are afraid of retaliations uh, of uh, retaliation the likes of ICE if they asserted their rights. And again, I, that was something that we mentioned in the in the previous segment here of how immigrants are, are targeted at a higher rate because they need to be the model immigrant. If they're not the model immigrant, then they don't get to stick around in this country. They don't get to have a home. They don't get to do have a job and take care of their families and so on and so forth. So they exploit immigrants in, uh, in, in that sense. So again, they're doing it here. Uh, the eviction lab estimates that these informal evictions are twice as common as ofi official Im evictions. And last June, the National Law Housing Pro Pro Project released a report that surveyed 100 legal aid and civil rights attorney in 38 states and found that 
91% of them reported illegal evictions in the area, with 53% actually seeing tenants being illegally locked out of their homes by landlords. Other intimidation and eviction tactics include cutting off utility surface, refusing to make repairs, making threats, providing misinformation, and a slew of lease violation accusations, such as satellite dish or a partner who spends uh, the night more allotted for in the guest section of the lease. So they basically, if you have like a, you know, more guests in your home, they can say that it's a violation of your lease as well. Um, by the way, the refusing to make repairs and providing misinformation, all of that is legal in New York City uh, because they do that for people who are rent controlled. Uh, and in order to get rid of their rent control status, they just go ahead and, and not do repairs. They make threats and they treat them like shit. So they have to leave. And then they can like tune up the apartment a little bit and and then charge, you know, up the ass for it. So and so all this stuff during a pandemic just becomes even more legal to do anyway. Uh, and is and now is being used as a way to circumvent um, eviction moratoriums across the country. This is happening. Uh, okay, so this is, I believe, yeah, this is the last section that I want to read. Uh, on the flip side, several media outlets have been quick to point out that the desperation many landlords are facing as they struggle to make ends meet themselves during the pandemic. It's true that there are many small-scale small scale landlords who say only own one property or rent out a basement of their home. But first of all, we all have to make the distinction between losing some income or losing your home. Secondly, a report by the C CBS Money Watch from late March of this year shows that landlords in general are doing fine, and in many cases, making big bucks off of the pandemic. For instance, Invitation Homes, the largest renter of single-family residents in the country, made $50 million more last year than in 2019. Mid-America Apartment Communities, the owner of some 100,000 apartment units, saw skyrocket, profit skyrocket by 60% last year. At the same time, apartment owners are doing perhaps the best of any anyone in terms of staying up on their rent. January figures show that just 2.3% of apartment building owners uh, were behind on their rent compared with 19% of hotel and 13% of mall proprietors. They also have plenty of legal backing. 90% of landlords nationally have legal representation while only 10% of tenants do. So again, it becomes a money game because these guys can fucking afford a bunch of lawyers and us tenants who can barely pay our rents. How are we also going to start affording a lawyer? So when they go to these court hearings, they have to represent themselves. How are we supposed to afford a lawyer in that situation? And when it comes to arguing for the so-called mom and pop landlords, uh, Diane Yentl, president of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, points out that with the latest stimulus bill, Congress has now put billions into rental assistance with most of that money going straight to landlords. Meanwhile, you'd be hard pressed to find a renter who has come across any of those billions earmarked for rental assistance. Could it be that here again, we see the sadistic obstacle, uh, obstacle course of eligibility and accessibility issues combined with straight up systemic dumb shittery? Indeed we do. From state and local rollouts moving as slowly and as crookedly as molasses through a pinball machine to, to having to demonstrate a risk of homelessness. It's no wonder renters who need aid the most are not the ones getting it. And to be fair, even if they did some get some assistance now, what good will that do when the debts are called in after the moratorium? So like I said, this becomes a stopgap measure. So how are these people supposed to afford rents? How are these people supposed to keep up on all of these bills? It becomes, um, it, 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 it just becomes impossible because the debt becomes insurmountable. I'm kind of facing this version of this with my car payments where I might be able to catch up on it eventually, but probably not till the end of this year maybe even um, into like early next year, which is part of the reason why I keep thinking about touring. And, you know, like my margins were pretty low because I wouldn't get hotel rooms or eat out all the time. Like I, I would travel with my own groceries. I would either sleep in my car uh, or I would sleep on a friend's couch or couch surf or something like that. But 
all of that is not going to work out because I have a bunch of debts I need to take care of now. Thanks to the pandemic, there was a moratorium on the debts. There wasn't a cancellation of it, which means that my in in interest accrued and now I have to pay back against that. And when I argue that with the car company or, or I'm sorry, the bank, the, the, the bank that my, I, I have my car loaned out with, they just tell me this is the way that things are. Well, they fucking shouldn't be. And I kept, and the reason why they were able to like start going like, okay, look, we can cancel out all of the late payments and we can do this, that, and third. And I knew that they could, I knew that there was some kind of plan in place for this. But the only reason why she did that is because I kept telling her that you're putting me in a financial trap. I, I yelled that shit into the phone until she <laughs> basically came up with the plan. Uh, like I scared her, but how many of these people know that, that you can do that kind of shit? How many of these people know that there's probably loopholes? There's probably aid that they can utilize. The rental assistance, the stimulus bill, all of that went back to corporations, went back to the banks because guess what people paid off? Their credit card bills, their car payments, their mortgages and their rents. Who, who made out in the end through that quote assistance that they put out there? It was the bankers and the landlords. So why are we not canceling the rents if they're making out big anyway? And and they keep the minimum wage stagnant, so it doesn't matter how much you know debt is accrued. Here's what I think we need to do with minimum wage, right? So the point of having a wage at all is to is to be able to cover your basic needs, right? Is to work and be able to cover your basic needs. Well, one, we're shifting away from uh, we're shifting away from that mentality of work. Uh, work shouldn't just be something you do to cover your basic needs. I think the mentality of that is starting to shift and, and we're starting to push back, right? That's why we saw uh, over 3,000 strikes last year. That's why we see, uh, be, you know, the, there, there's a fight to unionize uh, within Amazon. Labor is going to be a crucial focal point to this. So wages need to cover all of our basic needs. If, if we're going to say that we're, we're going to run off the wage model here, right? That's shelter, food, internet, bills, that sort of stuff. And then you need to get, and then on top of that, it should also be able to have an additional 25% that people can put into their savings for a rainy day. If something crazy happens right now, people can't afford a $400 emergency. So people should be able to afford emergencies when that happens. So a, a minimum wage or, or wages period should involve something where people can put money away and then on top of that they should have 30 percent of uh of something for you know recreational activities so that they can actually enjoy their lives so that work doesn't become this drudgery for just covering basic needs and not just that minimum wage should be the maximum cost of living in the most expensive city in the country for example that would be san diego right uh, give you an example to make sense of this thing uh, on average, I, this number is probably not 100% accurate, um, but let's go with it for the sake of the argument. Uh, based on something that I looked up, on average, you're looking at a cost of living in San Diego being about $2,000 a month. $2,000 a month in San Diego. Um, which means that if you want minimum wage to reflect the cost of living based on the maximum cost of living in the country, we should be getting paid $21 an hour. It's roughly three times the amount of, that we're making now, which means that San Diego, anybody getting minimum wage in San Diego is making a third of what they actually need to live if they're working full time, which in a lot of cases, when you're working a minimum wage job, you're not working full time. So explain to me the mathematics of how these people in certain cases making one third or less of what they need to to meet their cost of living are now going to pay back five six seven eight months worth of back pay of their cost of living this is not just an insult to science considering the fact that creating more homeless people is going to create a new wave of this pandemic, which means that the more the virus is out there, the more it will mutate and create more variants that are not effective, uh, that, 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 that the vaccines are not going to protect, that are probably going to get crazier. 
So you're going against science with these evictions, but now you're also going to, against mathematics. So for an administration that says they're going to lead by science and lead by empathy, you're showing neither one. In fact, you're looking at the STEM industry, the science, technology, engineering, and math industry, and just making it the t -t industry. But even then, I bet that you'll, <laughs> you'll bail on the technology and engineering side of things pretty darn quick. Let's look at some comments. Uh, Jay Jackson says, uh, RE capitalism, what strikes me is how many American citizens think that this is how it is uh, supposed to be. They literally cannot conceive any other way. That's largely the media's fault, but uh, religion and pop culture drive it also. I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. It's it's impossible for me to like watch a movie or watch a show and not pick out like, up. Oh, there's some pro-capitalist rhetoric right there. Oh, there's that CIA narrative. Oh, there's that DNC narrative that's thrown in there a little bit. You know, um, it, it, it does get hard to, to, to decipher. But what's interesting, like, and, and Jay has a, a great podcast called The Sacred Now where, where he talks about religion and pop culture um, and covers a, a, a wide variety of issues, uh, you know, current, current issues that we're seeing in our country. But Jay talks about pop culture a lot. And what's interesting is when you when the closer you get to the source material when it's when it's pertaining to comic books um, and sci-fi, the closer you get to the source material, the less you hear those narratives. Right? Because in comic books, the art mirrors what's happening in real life, right? So the closer you get to that source material, the closer you actually get to some sub subversive content. Which is which I find to be interesting. The further you deviate from it, the more it ends up being like, okay, we can hear the CIA talking points in this situation. We can, you know, like like the, people get a little upset when whenever it's like, oh, they overdevelop the villain, like they quote overdevelop the villain. It's like, no, good. Let's let's see some gray area and let's see how the heroes deal with it because those are the comic book stories that are the most interesting to me. Those are the comic book uh, uh, stories and and sci-fi stories that are the the most realistic to me and the most intellectually engaging and the mo more fun too they're you know they're the more fun to me but they don't they don't know that and and yet you're right the media is largely responsible for it you know like like we talked about how routers was was framing it as oh man trump was feeding americans Pff, look at what what a shit job he did but instead of trying to fix the system and, and learn from our mistake, we're just going to get rid of it and keep dumping food while Americans go hungry. And people go, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's the economy, man. You know, you got to think about you got to think about the stock market in the situation. Like, who gives a shit about the stock market? Feed people. Hopping over to Rock Van. Zosevix, let me find your let me find your uh, your comment that to start this segment here. OK, uh, Zosevix says there is one truth as far as the credit comment goes uh, about keeping a running line of debt. Once you get a bank hooked on you like Trump, if your debt is so substantial that the bank can't afford to just take back all of your property and liquidate it, then you have uh, beaten the bank at its own game. <laughs> Uh, they actually fear that you will claim bankruptcy and bend over backwards to keep the payments coming in. Uh, but that's a privilege that only the richest, the richest can enjoy. Yeah, this, you, you know, a lot of people have told me about, uh, you know, property laws and, and all that kind of stuff. And the more I read about them, you, your, your last statement kind of covers it is it's not meant for you and me. Right. It's not meant for it's not meant for the average person to know. So it's. Yeah, keep yourself in debt. You're supposed to have some debt. You're you you're not supposed to completely pay off this thing. Um, uh, you know, like I was thinking about it the the uh the other week of of like, okay, if I got the stimulus, which I'm not eligible to get any of the stimulus, so the 1200, the 600 and the 1400 that came in, I I was one of the people that fell through the cracks and just couldn't get it. Um well, what would I have done if I had gotten $2200? Right, I would have been able to get rid of the credit card debt I had. I would have probably been able to get rid of uh, a very old tax debt that I am still paying off, and I would have been able to maybe put a little bit more of a dent into um, into my car payment, and and started to work myself out of some debt. Uh, 
which would have meant that I could have probably, um, you know, taken this year to like I'm doing to get a second part time job, put put a little cash into the savings and next year try to logistically figure out what touring is going to look like in a in, in a in a COVID environment. You know, I don't I, that's a possibility. Again, like I said, the way that I kind of uh, traveled on a dime was I didn't afford a hotel. And now it looks like, you know, I would have to. Couch surfing might not be a possibility. Staying with comedians and, and random strangers might not be a possibility in this environment. They, not just because I might not be comfortable, but they might not be comfortable having me in their homes. You know, it's made things more difficult. But had my debt been less, I might have been able to move the timetable up a little bit more. There's a lot of financial roadblocks for to, to get me back out on the road. So, you know, but that's the point of it. That's the point of keeping people in debt. It's a it's 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 a a source of control for them, and that's exactly what's going to happen in this situation. There's going to be a bunch of back rent that people are going to have to pay, and they're going to be controlled by you know by the landlords by the banking industry. Oh, uh, Georgia Vicks just left another comment. Jimmy Dore said yesterday that he's getting the COVID shot and going on tours again in like a month, but Jimmy has a lot more. Uh, money than i do and a and a much larger fan base jimmy sells out theaters i do house shows <laughs> uh so that's the major difference there um previously he was going to wait another year yeah ron placone and lee camp and i have been talking a lot about when touring might be able to kick back up and and you know to to kind of look at the logistics we're not trying to get rich and famous off of doing it but just make sure that we're not in the red. If we can pay our bills, pay gas, put food on our table, then we're good. And before the pandemic, I was doing that pretty regularly. Um, and so was Lee. I mean, Lee's been doing that for years, but Jimmy, Jimmy's kind of in a, in a whole nother tier. I would love to be in Jimmy's tier uh, where I would be able to sell out some theaters or, a, a, and stuff like that. But even then I probably, you, you know, and this is sort of a, 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 a a way aside here um but i i don't know if i was at jimmy's level you know my me personally and this is I'm, I'm not saying that jimmy's doing the wrong thing or anything jimmy's doing what's right for him what's right for me is i probably wouldn't do a big theater or something i would probably do like a hundred seater max if i was at jimmy's level and i would probably sell you know i would do like two or three shows in one city at a time um because I think the hundred seaters are more fun and more intimate when you're in a theater, there's, there's a little bit of a distance from the crowd. Um, uh, and, and that level of intimacy and personal connection is, um, is missed. I, I find it more fun when the audience, not all the time, but you know, sometimes it's, it's more fun to play off of the crowd's energy and reactions. And in a smaller room, it's more fun to do than in a, in a larger room because, you know, somebody might made a little reaction to the left and you saw it and a couple other people saw it, but you know, the people is sitting five or six rows back might have not might not know what's going on. So I, I find the smaller venues to be more fun. And if I was at Jimmy's level, I would probably be looking at continuing to do some of the more intimate venues. That's a way further aside um than <laughs> I intended on getting. I would love to be back on the road. I would love to. Uh, I, I miss it every fucking day. There's a, there's a, a part of me that, you know, there's a hole in my heart, uh, that, that, uh, can only be filled by touring, but you got to make the best of the situation that you're in and, and fight for the situation that you want. Uh, and that's what I'm going to continue doing. So I'm going to try to continue doing that in the best way that I can. So, uh, I also have to get my, my physical and mental health back in, back in shape as well. Uh, cause I'm, I'm, you know, getting into my thirties here and being on the road the way that I was, uh, in, in 2019, 2018 and 2019 is not going to be feasible going forward. So I have to figure out how to make that more sustainable, both, uh, economically for me, uh, but also like in a physical and mental health term. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, cause boy, do I fucking miss touring. All right. Uh, before I get super depressing, let's go to the, <laughs> something maybe more depressing. I don't know. Uh, 
I want to I want to talk about what happened with Adam Toledo. Uh, we 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 have the footage now, and I want to uh, before we look at the footage itself because the footage itself is ridiculous, and I want to show you how uh, a network like NBC is covering this story and what what was hidden and how they're kind of spinning to make Lori Lightfoot look good in this situation, which she is not, by the way. Um, after the murder of Adam Toledo, the Chicago Police Department tried to cover it up. Uh, and they claimed, well, he had a gun pointing at the cops. Uh, they felt threatened by him. You know, he was waving a gun. Uh, I believe, let me see, something else that I... Oh, uh, Chicago Tribune specifically painted him as a hardened gang member. Kid's 13. Um, you know, what fucking uh, weird dark horse comic book, you know, plot line are you fucking snagging to, to write your stories? 13-year-old kid is a hardened gang member. Do you know how fucked up somebody's life has to be that by 13 you're a hardened gang member? What are you talking about? We're an insane thing to fucking insinuate. Uh, there's details coming out, you know, that that there he might have had an airsoft gun. Uh, and, you know, like what people heard, they called in because they heard, they called the cops because they heard a gunshot. And what they might have heard was the, was the airsoft gun. But Mayor Lightfoot d turned a story about gun violence. Because, again, it supports that narrative of, well, he had a gun pointed at the cops. Well, none of that was true. Uh, oh, and then on, on Tuesday, she closed the bridge, uh, which she did last year as well, to prevent protests, prevent any sort of marches from going forward. So a lot of this stuff is like, you're, you're doing shit that makes you look guilty. And then when the when the the footage came out where it was literally him hands up unarmed like he complied with the cop and the cop just showed up on the stream and pop 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 like and and, and then I guess they tried to do chest compressions so NBC and I'll, I'll 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 show you the clip here in just a second does frame it as though the cops are the good guys in the situation that and, and and frames it in a light that they tried to help Adam Toledo so let's go to that now. Let's do that now. I want to show you. Share audio. So this is the NBC reporting here. And if you can't hear this, please let me know. I'm going to kick the volume back up. This volume went down on that. That's exactly what it is. Um, the shooting transpired really what, what strikes you most when you first watch it is that this happened in just a matter of seconds, in under 20 seconds. You see the officer step out of his car, uh, pursue Adam Toledo down an alleyway. Uh, Adam slows down against a fence, sort of turns toward the officer as he makes commands for Adam to put his hands up in the air. And the shooting happens uh, faster, frankly, than you can, can process the scene. So they pause the video. They don't show the shooting. Uh, probably because... I think it looks like this 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 might be because of Copa cuz he's younger. Uh but they don't, you know, they don't they don't show the shooting. They kind of pause Some it right there. Some people expected that it would be clear that Adam had a gun in his hand that he had used it or was planning to use it. That is not clear from the video that we've been in, able to watch just in these last couple minutes. Uh you sort of see him turn toward and listen to the officer. And uh, sort of within the blink of an eye, he shot, collapses to the ground. And then most of the video, uh, of the body cam video worn by the officer involved in the shooting, is officers trying to save Adam Toledo's life. Uh, so the shooting happens in a matter of seconds. And then most of it is the attempt to do CPR, people asking him to stay with them if he can hear them. And you do not hear any signs of life uh, from this 13-year-old boy. And it is painful to watch the video. So... Again, they've kind of framed it as, oh, well, most of it is them trying to help him. There's a, uh, don't worry about that small little part where they fire a bunch of bullets into his chest and, and, and murder him, but they tried to help him. Did you guys see how they're... See, th that's protecting and serving because after they shoot you in the chest, they, they do CPR. Hmm? 
where's that defund the police? They wouldn't if you if the if you defunded the police, they wouldn't be able to do the chest compressions. Pretty cool, these cops. Pretty nice. This is this is by the way the Joe Biden argument. This would be the defund the police argument, a, a la Joe Biden. Is shoot them in the leg, right? Or actually, if you shoot them through the heart, do some chest compressions and tell them that you want him to stay with you. This is empathetic policing, according to Crime Bill Joe. We are watching the trial of, like, one of the most iconic cop, uh, killer cops. And in a, in a span of a week, we've had Dante Wright and Adam Toledo. One of them, 14 miles. Is it 14 or 4? Uh, very close to where the trial of Derek Chauvin is taking place. And in both instances, you see the cops panic. And in both instances, it shows you exactly what cops are trained to do. Dante Wright, Kimberly Potter thought her handgun was a taser. Two very different things. And there was surprise in what she did, but you still killed a kid. Because what are you trained to do? You are trained to go for your gun first. And you automatically fucking, that's what you did. That's what you did. You went for your gun first. Because psychologically, that's what the police uh, training shows you to do. It's not about de-escalation. It's about making sure that you shoot first and ask questions later, especially if somebody's black. Because if they're black, then they're doubly scary. If they're brown, they're just about as equally scary as black people. If they're white and they've already said that they have a gun and are flashing the gun and already murdered a bunch of people, you take them to Burger King. Well, they might be hungry, you know, firing a guy. It's a lot of work and they killed so many people. Their adrenaline is going up. You know, you want to make sure that they're okay when you interrogate them. That's it. it this just shows the systemic racism within the police departments. And in this, what happens? They ran up. Kids got his hands in the air. No weapons. Plop, plop, plop instinctually shot this black kid. And I know there's going to be a bunch of assholes. Oh, why did he run? If he was innocent, why did he run? What do you think you're going to do when the cops show up and the cops have a record of killing innocent black people across this country? Dude, if a random cop shows up when I'm fucking on my front porch and I don't know that they're going to show up, I'm booking it inside. Two years ago, I almost saw a, a black couple get shot in front of my house. I had a, a, a friend of mine that was um, coming over. I, I toured with this with this cat. This is 2018, so maybe three years ago. Uh, years are weird. Um, yeah, so he was coming over to stay, you know, because he was touring through. Uh, and uh, I he had texted me that he was on his way. And I was married at the time. My wife at the time goes, hey, tell Andrew uh, that he can't park on our street right now. I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, go downstairs. Look outside. I go downstairs. They blocked off my street. And there's uh, six police cars. Uh, all with their guns drawn out. There's an elderly black lady saying, it's okay, he's okay, he's not doing well. And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna witness, I'm gonna witness a fucking, uh, murder by the police. So I, I kept watching it through my window. Fucking terrified that if I go out there, I'm gonna get shot. So I texted Andrew and I was like, don't park by the house. In fact, don't even come near the house. I'll let you know when it's safe. You know, I, I told him that there's a situation. 
fortunately, everything was taken care of. There was a couple other people that, you know, direct neighbors that came out, uh, white folks, uh, that said, hey, stop. This is making it worse. He's he's having a schizophrenic episode. You know, he, he do, he's not aware of his surroundings right now. This is not helping. It's making it worse. And they were going to fucking shoot this dude. Eventually, they left. And the situation was handled. And the reason why the cops were called in the first place is somebody that isn't a regular in our neighborhood. And, you know, quite frankly, I didn't know what was going on. But if I saw a, a, a tuffle or if I heard something... I would talk to neighbors before I call the cops to be like, Hey, is everything okay? Do you guys know what's going on here? I live down, you know, I wouldn't call the cops, but I could have fucking seen this dude get shot and killed easy. And had it not been for some fucking white folk that were like, Hey, don't do this. Don't kill this cat. I, I would guarantee that they would have like riddled bullets and then claimed that they were their life was in danger. And the only reason why they were called is because there was a quote domestic disturbance called in by someone that doesn't live in the neighborhood. And the husband had an episode, argued with the wife. The, the argument got loud, right? They that's just sort of their their process of working through it. Cops get called, things escalate, gets way worse. What they needed in that moment was not fucking six cop cars and at least 15 guns pointing at them what they needed was a mental health profession professional to come to the house and work through the episode and if they would have shot him and tried to do cpr nbc is trying to frame them as if they're fucking heroes Oh, they tried to save the kid that they fucking murdered. Here, I'll show you. This is a, this is a Lester Holt, my fucking favorite. Lester Holt. Let's listen Breaking to Breaking news this. from Chicago. Police video just released of a, a deadly officer-involved shooting. This one involved a 13-year-old boy. It happened late last month. We need to warn you, the images are disturbing. Rahima Ellis is there. In the dramatic police body cam video, officers are responding to a call of shots fired in the early morning hours of March 29th in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood. In a matter of seconds, a pursuit Please turns stop. deadly. Stop right Listen now. Hey, show me your head. Stop it. Stop it. 13 year old Adam Toledo was killed. Police say a gun was found at the scene. The officer screamed at him. Police say a gun was found at the scene. Independent media is reporting it as air, airsoft gun. He had an he he had an airsoft gun that he dropped. That's the report that I've read. But here's the um, attorney. Show me your hands for the family. Adam complied, turned around. His hands were empty when he was shot in the chest. So far, police have not released any information about the officer. Why would they, they need to a not do that? year old man who they say was with Toledo at the time. Sin, put oh. your hand behind your back. Oh. Reuben Roman, arraigned Saturday, was charged with child endangerment and reckless discharge of a firearm. Chicago's mayor became emotional today talking about the video. No parents should After ever have a video. After she covered it up. After she covered it up. They're saying she's getting emotional. You made this about gun violence. These are Democrats. They killed this kid. They killed Dante Wright. They killed Eric Garner, Mike Brown, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Antoine Rose. The, the, the list goes on. And you have politicians that cover it up for them. Why? Because cops protect their stuff. And now what you're seeing, and this is, you're, you're, we're, we're probably going to see a, a wave of this kind of shit. And it's probably because of the George Floyd trial, the Derek Chauvin trial. Uh, George Floyd isn't on trial, although the defense attorney, Eric Nelson, would have you try to believe that he was. Uh, how can you put a dead man on trial? 
Um, you're you're a sick, sad, gaslighting motherfucker if you think that you're going to put a dead person on trial. Uh, but that's what Eric Nelson is doing. You're justifying this murder. None of these mayors should be trusted unless they go, these cop needs to be immediately fired and put into jail for blatantly fucking murdering somebody. So what do we need to do going forward, right? What's the what's the kind of lay of the land going forward? This is the ideal. I, I don't know if any of this stuff will actually happen. First of all, Derek Chauvin is guilty without a shadow of a doubt. Every single innocent verdict for killer cops should be overturned. The second that Derek Chauvin is found guilty, and if he is not found guilty, then there is no trust in the criminal justice system. That's it. Nobody can trust the criminal justice system going forward because it will prove that the criminal justice system is corrupt and broken. Once he's found guilty, once Derek Chauvin is found guilty, every verdict for killer cop should be overturned and qualified immunity should be revoked. I believe New Mexico did it. New York did it. Virginia started talking about it. Uh, at this point, there's no reason for qualified immunity to be in place because qualified immunity is a weapon to let sociopathic killer cops free to go and kill more innocent people of fucking color. Police budgets need to be hacked. More mental health and social programs need to be put into place. More community-based programs need to be put into place. Uh, better funding for schools and after-school programs so that, you know, if you have kids with two parents that work, awesome. They are taken care of at a place in the community where they can go and get help with homework, be around other kids, and, you know, be alive. Because if they're out on the streets, who knows? Some asshole fucking red rage cop might come in and pop them two times for playing with a with a, a matchbox car. Uh oh, matchbox. That sounds aggressive. Again, if you 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 listen to that video from NBC, the only person that was being aggressive was the cop. Put your fucking hands up. That's what he said. Put your fucking hands up. And when he complied, pop pop pop. And you fund Housing First initiatives. That's what needs to happen. Killer cops go away. Uproot the fucking police system. Fire all of the people that went through the training. You can become a fucking mall security guard for all I give a shit. There's plenty of other jobs you can do. You know where you can really work out that roid rage? Maybe in some construction projects. Don't be a cop, though. Because we're all fucking sick of seeing innocent dead kids and innocent dead black and brown people. And what we need is more pushback against the criminal justice system and against killer cops and against Democrats and Republicans that side with killer cops and actively fucking lie for them. We need, we need the working class to be in solidarity, push back against that shit. And we're already seeing it, right? This happened. Uh, I was so excited when Pittsburgh did this over the last summer. But Minneapolis just did this where they, the Minneapolis transit workers are refusing to, uh, to, to uh, take arrested protesters down to jail. They won't do it. <clears throat> we need other industries to join in. Taxi cab drivers. Lift and Uber drivers. Get in solidarity with the transit workers. If cops are going to use their vehicles to kettle protesters, use your vehicles to kettle cops. Uh-oh, now you can't leave. Once you move your cars, protesters continue to march along their way. Then you get to leave. We have to start protecting each other from the killer cops. Because I'll tell you that. 
I'll tell you what, if 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 this shit continues, there is going to be no trust in any form of law enforcement, period. So it's, so this course of action is high, highly counterproductive for the champions of capitalism that need cops to protect their shit. Realistically, the ideal is to uproot the system and rebuild, build something new, build something that that, uh, uh, that actually is about law enforcement and less about killing Less about protecting rich people's stuff. And that's not going to come from trying to reform this already fucked up, broken system that doesn't give a shit. Let's look at the comments. Aiden. Uh, there's no way she thought it was a taser, especially with that much experience on the job. Wear a tool belt to, to, well, to work every day. And you know where your fucking hammer is. Exactly. Exactly. There's there's no way that you didn't know. You reach for that gun. And even if it was autonomic, that just shows you systemic racism. And that just shows you uh, how biased the police training is. Cops are trained to think that everybody outside the police force is against them. That you are the enemy. That's what they're trained to think. And that's how they react. The It's provable. You, you're seeing the videos. Do, do, do. All right, I got to scroll up for the Rockfin comments. Uh, here we go. Zozovic says, uh, they, they said that the shots fired locators, whatever they're called, brought the police to the scene in the first place. Uh, said like six shots fired. Sounds like what I could be reading was all wrong. I didn't see any gun in his hands. Uh, it, it's okay. The reporter has brownish skin. Yeah, we're supposed to. Yeah, the the NBC reporter did have brownish skin. And Lester Holt, he was saying, you know, in that measured Lester Holt tone. Um, yeah. So from what I've read, it seems like he was playing with airsoft guns, and that's what the pops were. Um, but again, it doesn't. It wouldn't matter because at when he was being chased down. Hands up. No gun in his hand. He complied with the officer and was shot regardless. Now, the other cat was arrested for endangering a minor. But who, who was the one that was really endangering the minor? It was the fucking cop that had the gun pointed to the 13-year-old. Uh, it's pretty sick that they go this far as... They go so far as lifting the bridges. Yeah. Uh, it's like locking the population in their own rooms for bad behavior. Well, it's not even for bad behavior. It's for it's 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 for not disobeying the way that they want you to disobey. Like like when you're uh, when your parents we're watching the Goldbergs right now, and it's funny. It's like there are certain scenes where it's like I want you to be a, a rebel, but I want you to be a rebel in this way, and it's like that's not what the point of fucking being a rebel. Is. <laughs> um. This is what goes on to say. Remember the footage on YouTube where gangs of police slash military were going up and down the streets and they shot at people standing on porches? Yes, I do. I did not forget that. <laughs> uh, they claimed it was non-lethal rounds. Yeah, but they were shooting people's windows. And yeah, and those, those shots are only non-lethal when you fire them at the ground and it bounces off. When you fire it directly, it's a projectile. It can still pierce through. In fact, in France... Uh, during the Yellow Vest protest, there were like two journalists that were shot directly in the eye and lost their eye because that's how bad the, the damage was. Um, YouTube has probably purged 99% of its uh, of it, leaving 1% to MSM narrative videos. Uh, the gun gun found at the scene, but he wasn't holding it. Yeah, so so it doesn't matter whether there was a gun found on the scene or not. If there was a gun found on the scene and it wasn't an airsoft gun, uh, then you arrest him for possession. Right? That's kind of what you're supposed to do. Why would you need to shoot him when he didn't, when he wasn't armed? Unless you have biased training that treats, treats, teaches you to shoot first and ask questions later, especially if that suspect is black or brown. So again, if I mean, if these cops aren't found guilty, there is going to be a, there, there, this summer is going to be a lot more intense than last summer. And, you know, 
for for people that are going to be like, oh man, I wish it would just go back to being quiet. Well, it's not. the The Pandora's box is open. So the days of 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 complacency and for you to talk about cat videos and all that kind of it's over. It's over. Sorry, but this wasn't caused by us. It was caused by killer cops and the politicians that lie for them and the judges that allow them to continue going free and a criminal justice system that doesn't give a shit about justice. Uh, Zuzavex, thank you for the tip. Really appreciate that. All, all of these uh, very much still help. Uh, I'm going to look at Jay Jackson's comments, and then we will start wrapping things up here. Uh, there again, though, the actions where the public pushes back against Killer Cop require enough citizens willing to to do them. And unfortunately, I don't believe we're at a critical mass needed to make that needed to make that happen. Uh, there are still far too many Blue Lives Matter assholes justifying this shit. Well, they should read a Punisher comic, Jay, because the Punisher kills corrupt Killer Cops. That's what he does. <laughs> Their stupid Blue Lives Matter logo is wrong, and it and it is it is using the logo incorrectly, and it's very upsetting. Um, I, I I think you are probably correct in that sense uh, that we don't have enough of a groundswell, but we're building. Um, what's happening in Minneapolis is is kind of a resurgence of it, and we're all exhausted from it. But you know, I I will say if there are marches in the city of Pittsburgh. I will probably do my best to fucking go down there or at least amplify their voices. So we might not, we might not be able to, there are people that might not be directly able to go to the protests, but there are other roles to fill in direct action uh, that aren't putting your body on the line and being the, being, you know, uh, at the marches and all of that stuff. That's, that is still very important, but so is amplifying voices. And so is taking care of people you know, like if you know somebody that went to the protest, fuck it, get them some soup, make sure that they have some bandages, make sure that, you know, it's like, hey, get to, here, take some extra, uh, you know, bottles of water for any sort of tear gas incident, so on and so forth. So there's a lot that we can do. Um, as, as far as critical mass, I think we're getting closer to it. I think it's starting to become unavoidable. Um, so... I'm hoping the more coverage stories like this get and the more we can kind of look at the media, like corporate media specifically, and learn to kind of read through their bullshit, we might have a chance. You know, there we might have a chance for people to go, all right, I'm not listening to Lester Holt gaslight, just like Eric Nelson gaslight the American people about George Floyd and the and the bystanders. Um, you know, so it is, that's, that's part of the reason why I'm trying to include more like, you know, how the media is manipulating the narrative kind of coverage of, of some of these stories. Cause that is important to, to know, um, and debunk a lot of the, 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 the crap, the, the blue lives matter. People are, are the, well, I'll, I'll say this, the hardcore blue lives matter people. There's also the blue Lives matter literal liberals that are like, well, we need the cops. Well, we need somebody to do this, right? Those people I think you can talk to. The hardcore, like, there are people that leave comments on these videos on YouTube. I, I read one the other day. But those folks, they're too in with their with their belief system. And the only way to really jar them out is, is if the cops attack them. And then they'll be like, oh, man, you know, like that. So it has to be experiential for them because they don't care about anything outside their own individual family purview, I guess, would be something that you, it would be what you could call it there. Um, but those are going to be harder to get to. But the, but the Blue Lives Matter liberals that are out there, um, you know, the, the libertarians, I, you, you can get them to join in on that movement. Uh, just average workaday people you know, that are going home to listen to the news, you can get them to join in to the cause, primarily by breaking down the news that they watch and pointing out the the fallacies and, you know, the, the rhetoric they use. And once you once you kind of put that out there for people, it becomes really impossible for them not to see it. 
it becomes really impossible for them not to see it. So you, all you have to do is get them to see it. Take the blinders off. To those people, I think you can. To the people that leave shitty racist comments, like like one person literally was asking me, like, uh, like they were dead set on the fact that Floyd died of drugs, and they were asking me, like, why don't I go fix stuff in India? It's like shit like that, where they completely ignore the systemic problems within America. Um, those folks... It's not impossible, but there's like a 1% chance that they'll change what they believe in. Um, you can still try, and and I usually do. That's my first instinct is to, is to try, but it's way fucking harder. Way fucking harder. Um, we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, I'm not going to do a post-comment show, post-comment segment, because uh, we're already bumping up against two hours for the live stream. Uh, but, uh, I do, I, I'll, I'll do my little announcements and I do want to remind folks of, of schedule changes and stuff. So, uh, if you did like what we talked about today, if you think this is important, please do hit the like button, uh, and share this out with as many people as you possibly can, uh, share it with some friends, share it with some enemies. And if you want to subvert the censorship that this channel faces pretty regularly from Facebook and YouTube, uh, join the Rockfin community. Go to rockfin.com slash kushmohanhaha. Become a member through my channel, or you can endorse my channel for, for 10 bucks a month, uh, which helps me earn an income just, just by the virtue of creating content and people watching it. Uh, because Rockfin, it does not censor its content creators. Um, and they're also focused on content creators earning an income off of, uh, off of their content. So, um, yeah. And, and, and with that note, I will... I'm phasing out streaming on Facebook and um, YouTube because of the censorship that I face on them. Uh, I, I have been streaming on Twitter a little bit more, and I've been using Rockfin a whole lot more. Um, and I think Odyssey is going to start doing streaming pretty soon. So hopefully I will get that. Uh, get that going. So next week, in order to kind of get the YouTube community on board... What I'm going to do is make an announcement about that. So next week I'll be streaming on Rockfin, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, and then going forward, it'll be, uh, I guess it's called Periscope, Rockfin, and uh, Facebook temporarily until I get my Odyssey up. So so that's going to be a big major change coming up here. If you're on stable financial ground and would like to contribute to the show, you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. Uh, you can become a sustaining member, make monthly donations. If you are a sustaining member, you get an email with all of your bonus content, which includes early access to uh, a bunch of content. You get uh, bonus comedy and storytelling material. You get free tickets to virtual shows and live shows once those comes back. Uh, you get uh, other... I'm working on a bunch of other bonus stuff, but you get to ask me questions directly on those emails. You get to send me articles um, and I will respond to them and release them as exclusive premium content for the sustaining members. Uh, but you can also make a one-time donation. If you're over on Rockfin, you can uh, leave a tip for the channel uh, and all of those things help this channel grow and build uh, and and you know get better as, as time goes on. Last but not least, you can subscribe to my uh, uh, email list. It's free. It gives you a list of all of the, the podcasts and uh, videos that I've released throughout the week. And I do share the Rockfin links. Uh, again, I'm trying not to support platforms that are actively trying to get rid of me. Uh, so uh, I do share the Rockfin links on those. And that's at krishmohanhaha.substack.com. Uh, okay. I will... Uh, I will see you guys soon. Again, uh, we're changing the time of the stream to 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Uh, starting Monday. Uh, and uh, next week, I will be streaming on uh, YouTube, Rockman, and and Facebook and, and trying to phase out Facebook and, uh, and YouTube. So, uh, cool. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for leaving comments. Aiden, Jay, Zozovic, Sarah, you guys are all fucking great. Uh, I very much appreciate it. And uh, till next week, enjoy your weekend. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And we'll, we'll see you next week. See you on the road, guys. Bye.